What a beautiful song, amen? I rem- and, and I really, really liked like that song right now, especially after having celebrated Christmas. I think it's important for us to uh, understand um, what motivated Jesus to come as we kind of flow out of the Christmas uh, season now toward New Year and realize um, that it was an expression of the Father's love to send His Son to redeem fallen man. Otherwise, we are doomed. We're already proclaimed guilty. Without a way to escape, without a way to be delivered. So I love that song. I remember the first time I heard it, uh, I think it's Jesus Culture that sang that song. And the first time I heard it, I was like, wow. <laughs> and the, of course, the lyrics are beautiful. I think I listened to it like five straight times. I just kept repeating it, kept repeating it. It was like uh, uh, just a great way to remind ourselves of the depth of his love for us and that his son suffered the cross on our behalf for our benefit. Amen. So uh, we're going to look today at, um, and we're going to go back to Galatians. Uh, Remember we were there before we started these Christmas sermons. So it's Galatians 5 that we're going to pick up at. That's kind of where we left off. So what I just want to do is uh, just pray over the sermon. Um, We're going to go verse by verse like we normally do. Uh, I'm using the English Standard Version. You'll see it up on the screen and hopefully up on your screens over here. Uh, Don't forget Paul is um, defending the gospel against those that would come and say that what he did at the cross wasn't enough. That it wasn't sufficient. Uh, they were um, trying to impose uh, Moses' law as a way to have access and to be declared righteous uh, uh, before God. And we, we know that that's a futile. It's never going to happen. Uh, because um, if we break one part of the law, we've broken all the law. And we stand guilty before the Lord. So we needed another way, plan B, if you would, which was the cross. Amen. So Paul's surprised. Remember, he's like, hey, I I, I taught you guys the the truth. Uh, Who are these people that have come in and persuaded you to think otherwise? And then basically that Christ wasn't enough, that the cross isn't enough, that, you know, all that was fine. It's great that you believe in what Jesus did for you, but there's, there's one more requirement, and we know that the big issue in this particular um, book is circumcision. Uh, the, the, these people that came in and wanted them to follow these rules and regulations and, and rituals, uh, they came in uh, trying to, con- and they kind of upset what Paul had already established. The church had already understood that it's only by looking at Christ alone, not anything else. It's Christ plus nothing equals everything. Amen. It's hard for us to understand uh, sometimes, especially if we were brought up in the church. Uh, we tend to begin to kind of lean into uh, how, how good we are. And we start to believe that for some reason we're God's favorite. No, we're God's chosen through Christ because of what Jesus did. So we're gonna, that's kind of where we're at. And so Paul is going to suggest and describe this activity of trying to go back to works by these, in other words, legal requirements. The people that push these requirements are called legalists. So he's going to push back, and he's going to talk about the freedom that we have in Christ. So let's pray, and then we'll just get right into it and uh, kind of just uh, break this apart a little bit, and hopefully we can see um, the amazing message that the gospel is it it always will be it it can't change we are saved by grace through faith grace is God's unmerited favor it will never change Jesus paid it all Jesus did it all we just need to trust him and we're right with God that that's the message that uh, obviously for the the legalist that's too simple you got to do something no, you don't got to do something because you can't do something. 
Even if you wanted to, you can't. The law, is, the standard is so perfect that we fail. And one failure is enough to keep us out of the presence of God. But Jesus' success and what he completed on the cross is enough to bring us before the Father if we only believe. So let's, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Uh, we're back at, uh, in Galatians chapter 5, and we want to allow you, Lord, to speak to our hearts again and to give us, uh, if it will, a refresher course on the simplicity of the gospel, but the magnitude of what happened and why we are less beyond measure when we believe in the finished work of Christ. We ask you, Lord, to continue to bless us as a church, uh, bless us, uh, our families, the church families, and, and bless us individually, Lord, as you deal with our hearts I intimately, Lord, through your word. Uh, we pray, Lord, the Holy Spirit this morning will have the freedom to uh, minister to us and to touch us so that we might leave uh, today different than how we arrived, that we might get recharged in our faith, and that we might be and when we leave this place and go back out to our responsibilities and to the world out there, that we might be effective witnesses of the transformation that has taken place in our hearts because we know Christ and he knows us. We ask these things, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm a big fan of Paul. I... I saw a movie uh, uh, not too long ago about Paul when he was the persecutor of the church. And it's kind of interesting when you can actually see, like, scenes. Uh, he was mean. And he was one of these uh, Pharisees and legalists, these uh, Judaizers they also are known as. So he knew them well, right? Takes one to know one. You ever heard that? You know, I always like to say uh, in my field as a teacher... And um, since, uh, by God's grace, I'm making every effort to be the most professional teacher possible, uh, you know, because I call myself a Christian, I should be the best possible. And I always uh, find it interesting that you can run into teachers that you know that really all they're there for is a paycheck, especially when you go to talk to them about another student or trying to help a kid, and that's a lot of what my job is, and I realize no, I'm not going anywhere with this person because he's really not interested in his profession. He's just interested in having a salary and a paycheck. And I was walk away saying, it's interesting how you one professional knows another one. When you meet someone that's truly genuine and you're familiar with that because that's what you do, and it, think of your jobs. What you got. I'm sure when you drive down the <laughs> in your truck there, Leo... You can know when there's a truck driver out there that's not really a good truck driver. You know. <laughs> you're, you're get, I would say the same for whatever your profession is. Well, the same is true for Paul. And why he has such authority is because he was one of them. He was one of these legalists. So here's how it starts at verse 1 of Galatians 5. He says, um, and you'll see there's a number of verses up there, and hopefully you can see it up there. It says, for freedom... Christ has set us free. For the sake of freedom, he's set us free. He's, he's liberated us. So the main theme here is freedom or liberty. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. So what the legalists were doing, Paul identifies as slavery. He says, why are you going back into slavery? Why are you making yourselves prisoners again when you've been set free, when you've been liberated? Do you see that in verse 1? I mean, that's easy to see. The fact is, and notice what it says, Jesus, look what it says, Christ, what has he done? He has set us free. Which means we don't set ourselves free. Free from, from what? Well, I'll answer that in a minute. But I want to establish this first point. Freedom is a gift from Jesus given to us and received only by faith. Okay? 
So the, the, the theme here is freedom, but who frees us? Jesus does. I could easily say, who saves us? Jesus does. Can we free ourselves? Can we save ourselves? No, that has to be established. Okay, that's what we are looking at. So what exactly is this freedom that Paul is referring to? It's the freedom from the tyranny of having to earn our way to God. It's freedom from having to earn our salvation. The idea that you have to earn it. The fact is you can't. But you could be led to believe you can. And that's a miserable life. Because you know you can't. And you keep trying, but you fail. Amen? You guys understand what I'm talking about here? Freedom from what? What is this freedom that, that we have in Christ? Right? And so it's the freedom from believing or trying to earn our way to God. It's the freedom, listen, it's freedom from sin. It's freedom from guilt. It's freedom from condemnation. It's freedom from judgment. It's freedom from God's wrath, right? It's freedom from the penalty of sin, and it's freedom from the power of sin, and eventually it's freedom from the presence of sin when we finally go to be with Him. We'll never have to deal with it again. That's the freedom we're talking about here. Now, uh, we'll have to say when we're talking about liberty in Christ, or freedom in Christ, we also have to define what it's not. So I've explained what it is, but now I think we need to explain what it isn't. Today, uh, unfortunately, and throughout history, people live in the pursuit of, quote-unquote, this freedom, okay? I really do have to, uh, there, like, on certain passages, you really have to focus on the key words. Again, freedom. As Americans, we, that's the banner we carry, freedom. Again, freedom from sin, freedom from judgment, Freedom from condemnation. Freedom from guilt. Freedom from the power of sin. This is no small thing, is it? Sin is slavery. Okay? So, which, that's what we're free from. What, what is something that, as we define freedom, what is what it isn't is this, and I'll say this. People talk about freedom, and they believe, unfortunately, it's a misinterpretation, and it's a, it's a very dangerous way to think as a Christian. They believe, and they think of it as doing whatever they want to do, and never denying any desire that's not pleasing to God. Some people would call it, well, I can live in the flesh all I want. I can do what I want. Right? So this kind of freedom is a false freedom. Let me say this, and there was uh, many years ago, we, in our men's Bible study, we went through a book by Chuck Smith. It was called How Grace Makes a Difference. And one of the things that he had to do, and he mentioned, and I've heard other pastors and I've seen it, uh, throughout any, any, any pastor that teaches grace correctly has to warn the, co the congregation that grace is not a license to do whatever we want to do, whatever we please. You have to qualify it, right? Grace is not being promiscuous and thinking it's all right or living uh, licentiously. License, licentiously. It's not a license to sin, okay? So that's why Paul says, right after he says, for freedom, Christ has set us free. That's why he says immediately, stand firm, therefore. See that? It means, in order to stand firm, therefore, since we're free, it is something in which we must make an effort to stay there. A conscious effort effort and must have the correct knowledge to know that we're to stand there in our liberty which Christ has given us. Amen? So it's real important 
that we take a stand. That's what it means. Stand, therefore. Stand how? Firm. Stand firm. So I think it's important that we realize then that we're to take a stand in our freedom which Christ has given us. There's a saying, uh, you may have heard it before, uh, quote, those who stand for nothing fall for anything. You've got to have a position as a Christian. You have to know what you believe and why. Otherwise, you'll be tossed to and fro like the waves do so, right? When the wind blows across a sea or, the, or a lake, it just goes back and forth, back and forth, wavering. No, we need to stand. And more so, I think, in these days that we're living in. Will you take a stand? The liberty which Christ has given you that you've received by faith? That's the question at hand. So, when we struggle thinking we can free ourselves, what we're actually doing according to uh, verse number one, do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. We get entangled again with the yoke. What's a yoke? It's what they used on oxen that they would place around their neck and shoulders that would drive the plow or maybe pull a wagon. You see it on uh, animals today. Horses can wear them like the Clydesdale horses you see for the uh, Budweiser commercials, right? They pick these big yoke on them and they pull the weight behind them. When we try to save ourselves, when we try to please God on our own merits, it's like going back into slavery because it's impossible. It can't be done. We cannot reach God through our efforts by our own merits or goodness. We can only have access and a relationship with God the Father through the merits and the work of Christ already accomplished for us at Calvary's cross. Amen? So grace is a wonderful place to live, but you have to understand what got you there and what keeps you there. And you know what that is? Him. You must be connected to Him through faith. Faith is like an electrical cord. The power is electricity. But if this TV up here, this projector, anything electric, we have so many of those devices in our home. If you don't plug it into the outlet, that's faith. You're connecting to Christ. The power, the electricity flows, and you become a useful instrument in his hands. Otherwise, what good is a telephone without its battery, without the power source? What good is a TV without the power, or your router, or anything? What good is your car without gasoline? It's nothing but a paperweight. Our faith is useless if it's not directed to the object of our faith, which is Christ. He saves us. Christ has set us free. That's why we're people of gratitude. Because we understood we can't set ourselves free. That's the frustration of sin. Sin is like gravity. As long as you're holding it, something, an object, your hand or your arm has the power to hold it in place, the minute you let go of the power, or it's freed from the power, it, what, what will that object do immediately because of physics and because of gravity? It falls. Sin is the same thing. It, when we live or when we find ourselves in the condition of sinners, we can do nothing but fall. It's the power of God and it's the power of the Holy Spirit that lifts us up. And the only way to receive that power is through faith. You connect into Christ. I hope those analogies aren't too simple, but I hope they're also helpful. So Paul reminds us of, uh, of being submitted again or entangled again to the yoke of slavery, this weight, this burden, trying to reach God through the 
works of the law through your own good performance, through your own merits, is a burden. It's heavy, and it'll, it'll weigh you down. It'll tire you. The yoke that we're to put on is Christ's. If we're to carry a burden, it's the, the burden of Christ, which we also carry by faith. Amen? We rest in Christ. We have peace through Christ. We have joy through Christ. You understand the connection here? The center of our walk, of our lives as Christian is Christ. Amen? So, Paul uh, had an incident in Acts chapter 15, verse 10. You can look at it later. In which he had to confront Peter. Uh, because they were trying, as the Gentiles were beginning to receive Christ. Remember the gospel started in Jerusalem. Then it went to Judea. Samaria and then to the, out to the world. But they got into a dis, dispute as to once these Gentiles, these non-Jews were being saved, uh, well now that they're saved they got to keep the law and like circumcision and, and observe the Sabbath and, and not eat pork or in other words they're trying to impose all their rules and regulations on these Gentiles who not have a Jewish tradition. And so in Acts chapter 15 Paul says this, he says, now therefore, why are you putting God to the test? So when you tell someone they got to do this and don't do that in order to have a relationship with Christ, you're putting God to the test. Because what you're doing is you're placing a yoke on the neck of, of the disciples, those that were now believing. And then he goes on to say something interesting, because these were Jews doing this, right? Oh, it's really neat that you're now Christians. It's really cool that you accepted Christ. Man, he's wonderful. Faith is cool. Love is cool. God's grace is cool, but it's not enough. You also got to be circumcised. You also got to, uh, you can't have pig knuckles or eat hot dogs. Because, you know, it's not kosher. Those are our dietary laws. So, he says, it's interesting that you're trying to force these Gentiles who've come to Christ, who've accepted the good news of the gospel, but your fathers nor we were able ever to keep it. <laughs> That's called hypocrisy. Why are you telling someone to do what you don't do or can't do? You know, when I hear a preacher really spend a lot of time talking about adultery, I'm suspicious that that's what he's doing. Or if I ever hear a preacher talking a lot about a certain sin, I'm wondering, because, you know, sometimes they like this, like, overbearing on it. I'm, and this is why I love going verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book. I don't get to pick the theme. I just go into the Word in this expository style that I have, and I say what it says. Try not to put in my own opinion. And if I do, I'll tell you, this is kind of what I think, because there are different views here. You think you pick out what you want, what you believe to be the best to fit your understanding of the Bible. In this case, we see that the Jews themselves were not able to keep the very rules and regulations and rituals and ceremonies that they were trying to force the Gentiles to do. That's, that's hypocrisy. That's wearing a mask. That's being false. We're not supposed to be false. We're supposed to be true believers. We understand that we come to Christ and we come to the Father based on humility and confession of sin and repentance. And if we come to Him and confess Him our sins. First John says He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. We never approach God trying to believe that somehow we deserve anything that He gives us. Remember, it's a gift. And isn't that what we have learned through this Christmas season? Salvation is a gift. It's a gift you need. Amen? So, the Jewish teachers couldn't keep the rules themselves before God by keeping Moses' law. And so they, they couldn't because it's too heavy. And this burdensome yoke or weight that they themselves couldn't keep, they're trying to now force it on the Gentiles, the believers that came in. And uh, Paul says, hey, you're going back into slavery now, let me tell you a couple of things. I found some interesting facts. Do you know that the Jewish teachers, the rabbis, 
they have at least counted 613 commandments that you can find if you're going to keep the law of Moses. Think about that. Not 10 commandments like most people believe. How many of you have heard of 10 commandments? Gosh, I don't want to do this to you. Who thinks they could tell me all 10? Just the 10 commandments. Stand up and tell me. I'll give you the pulpit. Ten commandments, you can come up here and recite them to me. Nobody? Well, then think about this. That's not all there were. There were 613 commandments. <laughs> I can't even remember, you know, that at one o'clock I had a meeting, much less 613 commandments. So, to even remember them all is a burden. To remember them all. Much less to keep them all. Do you guys understand and see where I'm going here? It's impossible. It's impossible. We cannot be justified before God through keeping the commandments. Now, do, Pastor, are you saying we shouldn't keep them? No, I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying that they're there because they establish a standard. They reveal to us the righteousness or holiness of God. The law is good. Paul said so in Romans 7. The law is good, but oh, he would go on to say, uh, how to keep it I know not. Oh, wretched man that I am. And he realized that the law exposes us as sinners. It says, who shall deliver me from this body of death? And then he goes on to say, I thank God through Jesus Christ. That's who delivers us. So the law has its purpose. And so does the sign on the freeway that says the speed limit. But not everybody keeps it, do they? It has a purpose. It's a good purpose. Keep us safe. Keep us from, uh, you know, getting in a crazy wild accident. The law is good. I'm not saying it's not. It's just not able to save. All the law can do is condemn. So, we live in the bondage and that kind of relationship with God. And it's not what God wants. If you want to try and live that way, it's slavery. Amen? So, let's be more specific. Let's look at a couple more verses here. Look, now Paul says it this way. Let me turn this thing off. Paul, Paul's going to get a little bit more specific here about the details. He says, look, I like that. When Paul writes, he's trying to get their attention. Look. It's like saying, hey, look at me. Uh, would you look? Would you guys look me in the eye? You know, ever heard that? When the parents are dealing with their <laughs> their kids or uh, a teacher with a student, look at, look at me in my eyes. I want to make sure you understand. Paul's saying, "Hey, I want you to get this. I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, there's the issue, right? Christ will be of no advantage or benefit to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. Am I saying this or is it him? If you believe, but keep, because they were forcing the Gentiles to be circumcised like Jews. If you believe that, by the way, Paul would later say that we do actually participate in circumcision, but that cutting off, if you would, of the flesh, those of you that understand what it is, happened when Christ went to the cross and was cut off from the land of the living. He identifies it as his death, right? So it actually, we do actually participate in a form in the death of Christ when we accept his death in a, quote, type of circumcision or cutting off of the flesh, which is the old man that died at the cross, Jesus. We died at the cross. Our sinful nature died at the cross with Jesus. When Jesus went to the cross, he didn't go there for himself. He had no sin. He went there for us. So he identifies with us at the cross. Those of us that were alive then and those of us that he saw that would come to him in the centuries to come. And we, when we ba go get baptized, we are identifying with his death at the cross for us. That's why we go into the water to rise in newness of life. See, all these sacraments and 
things that we do like Lord's Supper and baptism all reflect the death of Christ. Amen? So, he says, hey, if you accept circumcision, Christ is of no advantage to you. What tragedy! All that Jesus did at the cross is of no benefit to you. I testify again to every man. He says it twice. When Paul or Jesus said something twice in the same sentence or paragraph, he's saying like he did at the beginning of the verse, look, this is important. Right? I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision, which was part of the law of the old covenant that God made with Abraham. And then that person who believes that you'll be accepted before law because you did that, you're obligated also to keep the whole law. So I'm going to do another test. I saw that not everyone can come up here and just tell me the Ten Commandments. So can someone tell me here if you've ever lied? Go ahead and raise your hand if you've ever lied. If you say no, you're lying. Yep, you already broke the law. I don't even got to go further, right? <laughs> it's when we see it, it for, have you ever, I'm going to do this too, have you stole something that don't belong to you? I, I, I know I have. Ooh, wait a minute, I'm, an, I'm living in, under the grace of God now because I've accepted Christ. Have you ever, um, you know, sometimes we have issues with people, you know, sometimes they disrespect us or they have, bend us or insult us and we don't like them and sometimes we even reach the point where we hate them we want to fight them we do fight them you know that jesus says that if you hate someone in your heart in your heart in your thoughts in your heart that you're guilty of murder by the standard of the law you guys know that you say wait a minute that's that makes me a murderer because i've hated people and under the law standard you are Have you ever, in the scripture, and Jesus says the same thing too, because the standard of the law is so holy. Have you ever looked at a man or a woman with lust in your eyes? Okay, here, and now no one's raising their hand. Oh, wait, Leo, thank you, so honest. Transparency here. Jesus says that if you've done that, you've committed adultery in your heart. You've broken the law. Why is it so, so rigid why is it so the standard of the law why is it so difficult can it be easier no because the point of it is to point us to christ and to allow us to discover our sinful condition so that we then can run to a savior that we need otherwise you think you're all right just like those who would want to try and have access to god based on their goodness and good works and deeds think that they actually have access to God. There's a lot of people who are going to go to hell and be surprised. But I, I, I helped the old lady across the street. Oh, I fed my neighbors. That's all good stuff, I'm, and I, you should. But that doesn't save you. Only one person saves you. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Nothing else. And we need to hear this. Because we live in a time where anything goes. It's called pragmatism. It's a doctrine that comes out of uh, the early 19th century. And it's been taught in the public schools for quite a while now. And it's the idea that if something's practical and it works and functions, it's okay. Even if it's immoral. And that's now the rule of the day. Everyone lives that way. Why do you think we have so much conflict in our government? And, 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 and why do you think there's so much conflict in our world? Because everybody thinks that their way is better. That as long as it works, it's fine. But there's only one way. And you guys know what that is? Jesus called himself, I am the way. The life and the truth. So Paul's trying to bring him back to Christ. And he says, hey, Let's go, and uh, we can see here that if you no longer trust in Jesus for the righteousness of God, then you're, let me say it again, if you are going back to the bondage of circumcision and the Mosaic law, and I don't know how the Gentiles would 
or could even do it. They weren't even Jews. Amen? Then what you're doing is you're no longer trusting in Christ to be declared righteous. You are trusting in whom to be righteous? In yourself. You're trusting in yourself because you believe you're doing enough in your own goodness to be acceptable before God, and that is a lie. No one can. I just described it to you. No one can. And I only mentioned three or four of the Ten Commandments. There's 613. So what does he say? If you try to approach God based on your goodness, what does verse 4 say? You are severed. You are cut off from Christ. I don't want to be cut off from Christ, do you? No, and then he goes on to say, you who would be justified by the law. I'm not saying it. Paul's saying it. You have fallen away from grace. Wow. Fallen away from grace? Yeah. If you choose legalism as a form of righteousness before God, you let go of the grace which is what established a relationship with God, if we embrace the law as our rule for walking with God and being just before God, then we let go of Christ. He is no longer our righteousness, and we attempt to earn it ourselves. That's what he's saying here. That's a pretty amazing verse, verse 4 there. You are severed from Christ. You're a little cut off. You, you who would be justified by the law, you have fallen away from grace. Is that, could that be any clearer? So it's not, our relationship with God is not law-based. Our relationship with God is grace-based. There is also this idea that because they were Jews, they were immediate, automatically in a relationship with God. So that was a race-based salvation instead of a grace-based salvation. Amen? Paul's telling them, that it's not an option. The system of grace and the system of law are incompatible. Whoever wants to have half of Christ loses all of Christ. It's Jesus plus nothing equals everything. What am I trying to do this morning? I'm trying to prove to you that your only hope is to keep your eyes on Jesus. Nothing else matters. Nothing don't get so upset about things. If they don't work out your way, it doesn't matter. If you can't figure it out, it doesn't matter. If you messed up, it doesn't matter. Because if your eyes are on Christ, then His grace covers your life. And He will direct you. And He will put you in the place that you need to be. Not because of your goodness, but because of His goodness. He's good. And you get to connect to that goodness and that righteousness and that mercy and that, and that forgiveness and that peace and joy just by faith. That's the only part that corresponds to us in the plan of salvation. And even that faith, He triggers in our hearts. Even faith is a gift from God. How gracious or how more gracious can He be that everything that leads us to salvation is because of God. Otherwise, he leaves us under the bondage of the law. We are doomed and condemned and guilty and under God's wrath and have no hope. That's why I love what Paul's saying here. Our only hope is Christ. Amen? So, uh, whoever wants to be, have half of Christ... Unfortunately, you lose the whole of Christ. You can only have him 100%. You shall love the Lord your God with, what's the next word? All. Your heart, with all, your mind, with all, your soul, with all, your strength. Not 50%, not 95%, all. And he didn't leave it there. And if that's true, church, if you love the Lord with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, then you'll love your neighbor as yourself. And then we can really now be effective in ministry. Because we'll love our neighbors like we love God. 
You want to see this church grow? Go love your neighbor. Let the Lord guide you by the Spirit on who to minister to and who to help and who to extend a hand of grace. Do you know that salvation or the whole idea of grace based on the Old Testament was a picture, the, the Hebrew was a pictorial language. Most of their symbols and their language depicted an image. Grace in, in the Old Testament is a picture of someone stooping down and extending their hand to help someone who can't reach up to get help. That's what the Lord did when he reached to us. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. He stooped down in humility when he became a man. And he extended his arm to us who were in a ditch because of sin and reached and said, you want to grab a hold of my hand? I'll pull you out. That's what salvation is. It's what God has done. Not what we do. Now, granted, when we come to know him and he transforms us and we're born again and we're new creatures in Christ, then there are good works that follow that. But those good works didn't save us. Those good works are the proof that we are saved. I just think it's important for us to realize that we've got to get the horse in front of the cart to make this work. So, now, verse 5. Now he's going to get into a little bit more. For through the Spirit... By faith, we eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. See, this is now given us the key. It's the work of the Spirit in your life. None of us came to Him by our own intuition or our own initiative. Jesus said, No man comes to me except my Father, what? Draw him. Do you realize that if you have made a confession of faith, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, it's because he first introduced himself to you? We love him because he first loved us. Our love to him is a response to his love. It always goes in that order. We love him because he first loved us when we didn't even know he loved us. He began to tap on our hearts. He began to bother us at night at least me, <laughs> and finally one day I surrendered because I felt the guilt and I felt the hopelessness, and I finally cried out to him, and as Romans 10 said, that if you, whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Got to do a little bit more humility here, people, and start reaching out and calling out to the Lord, especially in the days that we're living in, because he will answer. Yeah, through the Spirit, the Holy Spirit Jesus told Nicodemus, is like the wind. You don't even know where it's coming from. But you can see, and you don't even see it. But you can see its effects, like on the trees and on the leaves. Right? That's how the Holy Spirit works. He comes into our lives and He begins to transform our hearts. And what we do then when we recognize there's a work going on in our hearts. It's a truth. It's a fact. It's a reality. You know something's happening in your heart. You know that he's beginning to open your eyes to the truth. And so then we have no other option but to respond by faith. That's what Paul's saying. Through the Spirit, by faith, by faith, we eagerly, ourselves eagerly, wait for the hope of righteousness. Well, who, or what is the hope of righteousness? Well, the one of Jesus' titles is the righteous one. He's the hope of righteousness. We wait for, easily could say here, we eagerly ourselves wait for the hope of Christ. Not just his work in our hearts through the Spirit, but his soon appearance. He's coming again. That's what we're waiting for. No, and I know we have to make plans. I know we have to be busy and occupy while we're here. But believe me, it's all temporary. But we are to occupy till he comes. And until he comes, we're to occupy. So I said it frontward, backwards, sideways. And then he will come. And when he comes, don't you want to hear? And don't you want to know that you were faithful? Don't you want to hear him say, enter into my kingdom, thou faithful servant, good and faithful servant? That's the goal. And so, for, uh, he goes, for verse 6, in Christ Jesus, and here's something powerful. 
neither circumcision nor uncircumcision count for anything. Let me put it this way. If you're circumcised, if you're not circumcised, which seems to be the doctrine that the legalists were pushing on these and burdening these poor Gentiles that just came into the faith because they heard the good news, and he says it means nothing. It, it has no benefit. It's worthless. And remember, there's an argument in Romans about meat that was offered to uh, uh, idols, and then they would, that meat, because obviously, you know, you can put fruit or a mango in front of a little Buddha at your local Chinese restaurant, and believe me, he's not going to eat it. It's just going to rot. So what they would do is they would put this meat in front of the altars in Rome, because that's what they, how they worship their idols, their gods. And then after a little while, before it got spoiled, they would take it and go sell it. They've got to make a profit, you know. After all, it's costing us too much since their gods weren't eating it. And the Christians were getting a little upset, especially the ones that had a little bit of a Judaism in their, in their blood. And they were like saying, Paul finally says, meat offered to idols means nothing. Now, if you're weak in your faith and it bothers you, you who are strong in your faith, leave them alone. Just go barbecue it. It means nothing. Because <coughs> you know there's only one God. All the rest are made up. They're nothing. So Paul says circumcision nor uncircumcision count for anything. There's no benefit, but only faith working through love. What matters is a faith that works through love. True faith, then, if it's important. True faith counts. Not circumcision, right? And that faith is expressed or works through love. Now, this is really where I wanted to get, and we'll finish right here, and we've got a few more minutes. I want you to think about the last part of verse number six. It's powerful. In Christ, as Christians, and we're in Christ by faith, by the way, can't be in Christ without faith. Neither circumcision nor cir circumcision count for anything. I could easily say nothing you do counts for anything or matters. But what does matter, only faith that works through love. It's not just faith. See, because faith is something that you assent to or understand in your mind. But if you don't put it into action, or if you don't express that faith through love, it's not really true faith. See, ours is a faith, agapao, I'm sorry, that's love, uh, pisteo is the word in Greek for faith, it's a verb. You can't faith, I'm making up a word, you can't say you believe unless you act on what you believe. Faith is action based on a belief, it's not just action, but it's based on a belief and it's supported by confidence. It's continual. You continue to do it. Those are the ABCs of faith. Action based upon belief, supported by confidence. You then, when you read here, he's going and tying into the same thing that James says. Faith without works is dead. Or faith works. It actually works. It, it, it actually does something. You cannot see your brother who's hungry and or cold and say, oh, God bless you and leave him there without feeding him or clothing him. That's not true faith. But you do something to help him. Proving your faith expressed through what? <coughs> what does it say? Verse 6. Only faith working through love. That's what counts. So this verse tells us what does matter. Not circumcision. Not Sabbath keeping. Not keeping away from Dodger dogs because they have, you know, pork or whatever in it or pig knuckles if you like those pickled pig knuckles, whatever. Not, that don't matter. Dietary laws. 
faith working through love. You have faith. Let me ask you the question. You have faith. Wonderful. But it must be faith working through love. If your faith doesn't work, then it isn't real. That's what Paul's saying. If it doesn't work through love, it isn't real faith. Right? Your love alone isn't enough. Your love must also have faith or action. And that happens because you're connected to and trusting in Christ. And what he did for you. For God so loved the world, he gave. He just didn't say, oh, I love you. It's not like he got a daisy and said, I love you. I love you not. I love you. I love you not. I love you. I love you not. Oh, my God, I, I got stuck on I love you not. He said, I love you. And so what did he do? The very famous verse, God so loved the world, he what? He gave. His love, it was expressed, or his Love for us is expressed in giving. And what did he give us? He gave us his son. And what did his son give us? The work at Calvary's cross that redeems us from our sins. So if there's anything we can learn, I'm going to finish right here. Faith must work through love. Real faith, saving faith will work through love. That's why to know the love of Christ is so important. Because that's what motivates us to do what we do. My prayer for you in this church is that you would come to, love, to know the love of Christ. Because if you genuinely do, the rest will work itself out. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you again and again and again for your son, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Father, when we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't wait for us to get better. He didn't wait for us to be able to log in our journals all the good things we've done before he did anything for us. He loved us when we were unlovable. And he expressed that love at Calvary's cross. He did something to prove it. There was evidence of that love. There was fruit of that love. And it was his sacrifice at the cross. Help us, Lord, as a church. Help us, Lord, as individuals to only have a faith wor working through love. Nothing else matters. As we've seen Paul's argument here and how he defends the good news of the gospel. Help your love to rise up in our hearts so that it makes a difference in our witness so it makes a difference in our lives and in our families. So it makes a difference, Lord, in our walk. That people will see Christ, not us. And we be like John the Baptist, where he said, I must decrease so that he may increase. That is our prayer. And I pray, Lord God, that if there's someone here today, and you see their hearts, and you're speaking to them now, we pray that they would respond to your call to the good news of salvation by saying yes. That they would see their need to confess their sins and to turn from them and follow you. And that is a work, Lord, that you're doing by the Spirit. And we're so thankful, Lord. We do pray, Lord God, that this be uh, something that you do with us every time we meet. That you deal with our hearts. And that we deal back with our hearts to you firstly. And then that that fruit, Lord, would come out, Lord, to prove that they know you. We ask you and pray, Lord, these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the Lord Richie, bless you guys. We're going to have um, uh, Cassandra come and lead us in a uh, worship song and then afterwards we'll, we'll take our offering and then uh, we're going to get out a little bit early. <laughs> okay, God bless you. <laughs>